And now, right to your host of this house of musicians, Barry Smith. Hey, welcome, fine listener, to this House of Musicians radio show on Reality Radio 101. We hope you enjoy the next hour with us as we do our small part to help promote musicians, bands, and venues. Gary Labar, how are you this evening? I'm I'm excited how I am. First of all, we have icons in the Canadian icons. music industry on the air with us tonight. Rock legends. It's unbelievable, folks. We have uh, Martha Johnson and Mark Gain from the band Martha and the Muffins, Juno, a win, a Juno Award winning band, and uh, just um, great music we all grew up with. Um, please help me say hello to Mark and Martha. How are you guys doing, Mark and Martha? Uh, we're fine, thank you, and uh, hello to everybody. Good, e- good evening, everybody. It's, a, it's an honor to have you guys on the show. Um, I remember uh, listening to you many for many years. Uh, Echo Beach, of course, was, was, a, was a great song, and, and uh, so many people danced all over the world to that song. So it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Let me um, start off by asking Martha how, ma'am, you were introduced to music when you were younger. Were your folks musicians? Did your brother have... Um, a, a vinyl collection that you grew up playing and listening to, and maybe who were you influenced by when you were younger? Well, I had an older sister, so, so I fo- followed her um, patterns a lot in my musical taste when I was really young. And my grandmother was a piano teacher and very musical, and uh, she was she, she would play music on the piano and sing dir- dirty songs. <laughs> <laughs> and. But, but my biggest influence, I guess, was um, re- really um, when the Beatles came out, and I was just go- completely mad about them, and uh, really your typical f- fan of very, very young age, and uh, I saw them three times play in Toronto. <laughs> Well, isn't that something that you saw the Beatles, not just once, but three times? I didn't get the honor to see the Beatles, but um, did see Paul McCartney. But you would be so you wouldn't you would be amazed at how many artists we have on the show. Um, I think this is our 79th show now that I've done. Um, and at least 80 percent say they were influenced by the Beatles. Um, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, they don't say the Rolling Stones. They don't say Pink Floyd. It's usually always the Beatles. That's so impressive. And Mark, how about you, my friend? How did you you who were you influenced by growing up and how did you know you wanted to play music uh well i also came from a fairly musical background uh, and family my mother uh was, played the piano very well so she would play a lot of classical stuff at home and sort of um uh the songbook from the 40s um a lot of those composers and writers and um, so there was a there was a music and artistic uh, thread running through my family, and I guess uh, well, like Martha, certainly when I was young, it was the Beatles. I mean, you know, if, if you weren't um, there at the time, or you're too young to have been there, it's very hard to underestimate the huge impact they had. So you know, that certainly would have been the first band that I listened to, and of course. Uh, there was that February night where most of North America was watching their debut on the Ed Sullivan show. And, uh, you know, as a kid, it just blew my mind. <laughs> Absolutely. Both, and I was going to say, we both got guitars at a fairly early age too. I got my first guitar when, when the Beatles, Beatles first came out. So I still got that guitar. It's a Faulkner acoustic. Amazing. And how did you learn to play Martha? How did I learn to play? Well, I didn't learn to play that well. I had a few lessons and then uh, gave that up and just self-taught. Yeah, me as well. Um, Mark, you're just an amazing guitar player. Um, tell me how you uh, started playing guitar uh, when you were when you were younger. Maybe at what age did you start playing and how you taught yourself? Uh, let's see. I guess I was probably about 12 or 13 and I got... Uh, my first acoustic, which, you know, was pretty basic and very hard to play. And I, it seems to me, I remember the first thing I did was tune it to an open chord because it seemed easier to play that way. And uh, 
you know, and obviously there's, right. a, there's a lot of cool music that's played, you know, with open tunings, but I did take guitar lessons very, very briefly for, you know, a couple of months and then stopped. Um, and after that, I basically taught myself um, and, you know, picked up, I was a very avid listener. So I would listen very carefully to what other guitarists were doing. And also not only just guitar stuff, I'd be listening a lot to everything. And that all kind of got incorporated into my playing. But I would have to say later on, you know, apart from people like Jimi Hendrix and uh, early Cream and the, the sort of first wave of rock music, my one of my biggest influences uh, was Robert Fripp of King Crimson, even though I, I come nowhere near his technical ability. It was the sound of his guitar and his unusual approach uh, to soloing that really intrigued me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and uh, what a great band they were. Um, let's let's talk about when you guys first met. Now, I know the lineup came together uh, in Toronto in 77. Um, David Miller asked, uh, you know, you're an art Ontario College of Art student, uh, Mark, and asked you to help him uh, start a band. And then, of course, you uh, met Martha Johnson. She was playing keyboards. Um, and, and let's just start there. I mean, what a, what a great band. And by the way, Martha, you have an amazing, distinctive voice. Um, you know, it's it's just so distinctive and and. Uh, different i guess that's what distinctive is it's so different than than your average female voice which makes the band what it is the distinctiveness um so but tell, tell me how martha you guys the first time you met mark and and how you guys created this band oh well, thank you for that uh, compliment um i do think whenever i hear a, a song of ours on the radio or, or somewhere in a, in a mall or something we, we stand out because we don't sound like anybody else. And I guess that is because my voice is very different from uh, most singers. But uh, I remember meeting Mark, um, three of us got together in a, a, I don't know whether it was probably at this, at a, some, a David's house. Yeah, it was a, David Miller was renting uh, house on um, part of a house in Cabbage Town in Toronto. And I think, uh, I do remember that first get together. Was that? Were you there for that, or was that a bit? Weird? I remember practicing once there, but you know, you know, just meeting somebody new, and and you know, so he was a cool guitarist. I thought, but we we didn't really have any songs or anything at that point, so we were just getting to getting to know each other. Yeah, and uh, getting to know each other, and and so did you guys just. Did you start a band playing covers in bars before you started writing? No, not at all. We we were doing um, pretty much uh, original music, as, as I remember it. Um, David was writing some songs. They were just little tunes. And they were very quirky little things, you know. Yeah, they were, were basically all trying right. songwriting as beginners. And so... Um, the early shows we did, when we did actually finally start playing as a band, uh, we did have to supplement our sets with cover versions. So we did have, you know, some of our songs, and then we uh, kind of filled out the sets with uh, covers. We did a cover of Day Tripper by The Beatles. We did My World is Empty Without You by The Supremes. Uh, we did motorbiking. motorbiking by Chris Spedding, and we did um, what's the instrumental? Oh, Telstar. Yeah, Telstar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so like a very cool. long collection, and you know, done in the um, done in a way that only Martha and the Muffins could do them. <laughs> yeah, we were right here. <laughs> Well, definitely high energy uh, band for sure. Martha and the Muffins. Now, did you guys, uh, did you, when you guys were playing your originals, I'm curious to know if you let people know that you were playing them or if you just snuck them in there. Uh, no, I think, you know, given the scene that was going on on Queen Street um, at that time, and this would be like about uh, before us, but, you know, starting around 75, we started in 77, but there was a real small but supportive scene that was based around 
uh, the Beverly Tavern on Queen Street, which was sort of the, the uh, watering hole of the Ontario College of Arts students. And it also revolved around the art college itself. So the bands that were forming then generally didn't, they weren't on a bar circuit. They were playing at the college or the Beverly or maybe, uh, the, horseshoe. maybe the horseshoe a bit later on. <laughs> And it was it was very small scene, like not, not that many people knew about it, other than the art students and all the people that were from Thornhill. Thornhill too. Yeah, there was a big contingent from Thornhill, which is a suburb north of Toronto, where a lot of pe people ended up coming down as students and forming bands. Yeah, a lot of people I went to high school with. Wow. And, and uh, you guys debuted at the Ontario College um, of Art at a Halloween party they had in October of 77. Um, so let me ask Martha, what was that like coming out on? Was it the first time you actually played in front of um, um, people? I think it was the second time, wasn't it? Uh, no, that was the first. Oh, was for the yeah. Shock Theater? Was the second. Shock Theater was second, yeah. yeah so. so the first time, well, I was so terrified. And uh, <laughs> even though I've been in other uh, other band, a couple of other bands before that, it was in a band, uh, an OCA based band called Oh Those Pants. With a bunch of guys, okay. ten guys or something, in me. I, I was just doing um, a little bit of keyboard stuff and a little, some backing vocals. But this uh, this was the first time I'd been a bit. Well, no, actually, in the Doncasters, I was front person too. But we they only had two gigs and they, they then dissolved. But uh, I was just scared, and my mother. Would, I told my mother I was I was nervous about the show coming up, and she said, "Here, dear, darling, here's the Valium. T take take that before you go on." <laughs> I don't know whether I took it or not. I can't remember. I, mean, I, I probably wouldn't remember. You don't remember? Yeah, when you took it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that means you took it. If you don't remember, that's right. Yeah. That's too funny. Well, I always found when I was playing live, it's a little nerve wracking when you first come out, I guess, when people start dancing and singing. And for you guys, uh, I guess, later on in your guys' careers, when you got people screaming in the audience and singing your original songs, that's just outstanding. I mean, you really can ease the nerves a lot after the first song or two, if, you, if everyone's into it. Yeah, well, they were on your side by then. And we, we were very popular. And I think when we played at the Beverly or... Later on, on at the edge, it's quite a scene. There'll be people lying around the court, around the block and get in, and it was a lot of fun. Absolutely, um, yeah, I bet it was. And uh, so now, I'm, I'm curious to know how many originals you actually had when you started going, uh, when you started playing the circuit. How many originals you actually had at that time? Like, did you guys write a whole bunch of originals and then just go play those? Yeah, they had quite a few original songs. I think well, probably the three quarters at least original songs, but there, there were different writers, so the, so the songs were very different from each other. One of the first songs I wrote, I think, was by Number Heart. It was on the first Metro Music album. And Mark, what was your first song? Um, it might have, well, I don't know what the first one was, but Suburban Dream was definitely one of the first um, primal weekend <laughs> uh, <laughs> insect love, like a lot of really, you know, weird art school band songs. Um, but your I, third song was what? Well, I think the third song was Echo Beach. And, wow. Um, you wrote that in the sound lab at school, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Most of it. Um, uh, in fact, we actually have a recording. The very first recording ever made of Echo Beach was done at the Sound Lab at the Ontario College of Art because both uh, myself and David Miller worked there as uh, sound monitors. And um, I did a little demo. And the only thing on the demo, I think it's two tracks, and one is a rhythm guitar part, and the other part is the hook line. And that's all it is. There's no vocals. It was basically a song sketch. Right. And so now um, you wrote the song, uh, I guess, how long after was it introduced to an, uh, on an album? Well, I wrote it in 78. So we basically played it for two years until we were signed by Virgin in the UK. And then um, in 79, when we went to England and recorded our first album, Metro Music, uh, that was the album that Echo Beach was on. 
Um, but before that, we actually did a demo version at a small uh, Toronto studio. Integrated sound. Integrated sound. And mm -hmm. uh, so that was the demo that I think... Got us the deal. Got us the deal, yeah. That's amazing. That's that's so amazing. And, and uh, you know, they're still playing it on the radio today. It's just incredible. Um, I want to know, Mark, where that song came from. Is there a beach? Is there an Echo Beach that you used to drink beers with with your friends? Or just how that song came about? Well, there probably are beaches where I did drink beer with friends, but Echo <laughs> Beach wasn't one of them. <laughs> um, no, it was strictly a product of my imagination. And um, the main uh, idea came from when I had a job at a wallpaper factory during between the first and second year of my art college days. And the job at the wallpaper factory was to um, examine damaged roll, huge rolls of wallpaper that had been wrecked on the giant presses. And they would roll those off. And my job was to unspool them and separate the good wallpaper from the wallpaper that had been damaged. And while I was doing that, I thought, well, you, because you didn't really have to think about what you were doing. It was kind of an automatic, you know, bunch of actions. So I, I was going, boy, it'd be really nice to be somewhere else. And that was really the germ of the idea, you know? And so when I wrote the song, I, I couldn't say my job is very boring. I'm a wallpaper inspection guy. <laughs> and so I had to think of some other occupation that I thought would be more universal. And I thought of office clerk. And uh, But a lot of these things, you know, for both of us when we were writing songs, I don't think we thought too much about it, did we? I mean, we just think of things. And luckily, in some cases, they all fell together into a decent song. Sure did. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, so now you guys, let's let's just. I just want to jump ahead a little bit here because now you guys have a new release out. It's the first um, thing that you guys have done in 11 years. I mean, that's this is impressive. What made you think? Okay, so did you just take 11 year hiatus, or you just haven't recorded in 11 years, but you were still playing? Um, let me ask Martha. Um. Well, we weren't playing live, really, but um, I, I guess what we, what we were doing was uh, writing and doing a lot of writing, and um, I can't remember what we were doing for the last <laughs> years. It's, it's all a blur, guys. It's all a blur. Yeah, no, okay. um, no, no. We we write and record pretty much continuously because um, we have a small home studio. It's nothing, you know, super elaborate or anything, but we get a lot of good work done there. And, um, Martha actually has been working on a new Martha and the Muffins album for about three years. And I've been working on some solo projects as, as projects as well. So, you know, in that respect, we're always busy. I had a solo album. I just remember too. <laughs> yeah. You did a solo album in 2013 called solo one. And um, we've been collaborating with younger songwriters as well over that period. So even though you don't hear from us for sometimes long periods of time, we're still alive and we're still doing stuff. And um, this album came out because, uh, well, our manager, Graham Stairs, has been bugging us for years to do what he called an odds and sods album, which was you know stuff that was never released. And I shouldn't say bugging him, uh, bugging us, because to his credit, we actually finally did it. And as we, you know, went through all of our archival our archives, uh, we thought, well, there's some really good songs here. That either, either came out, out um, in a limited fashion or, or didn't come out at all for various, various reasons. Right. So, and and how far back? How far back? Oh, really far back. Yeah. Uh, the earliest one on this album is 1990. Uh, no, it's 1984. Amazing. Yeah, that's great. And okay, so here's what I want to do, um, Martha and Mark. I want to play. I love this song. Again, it's it's upbeat. It's got a lot of energy. So I want to play Do You Ever Wonder? And this is the debut single off the new album, correct? That's, that's right. true. 
Yes, and it's uh, it's just so so uh, it's got so much energy, um, and and you guys have not changed. And just let me say this: hopefully, um, uh, I'm not going to offend you, but you have, which is it's a good thing that you guys have not really changed, in my opinion, your style of of being that new wave kind of um, pump rock band. So I'm I'm happy for that because you guys still sound this. This could have been on a 1977 album to me, and or 1980 album and it, it would still belong there so good for you guys for that i'm um, sticking to staying the same you know you get some bands um that change their style as they move along and it's just not the same uh it's not the same as say their first or second album they move into almost maybe even a different genre let's say but you guys still still sound exactly the same so cahoots to you for that because it sounds great um so let's play do you ever wonder and then i'd love to come back and talk a little bit more about that song great, great. folks i'm stoked to have martha johnson and mark gain from martha and the muffins on tonight's program um we're going to listen to their new song debut song um after 11 years uh, uh first release in 11 years their their song called do you ever wonder um right here on this house of musicians radio show on reality radio 101 <laughs>
Hey, welcome back, folks. Uh, I have Martha Johnson and Mark Gain on tonight's program from Martha and the Muffins. Um, of course, uh, everybody knows Echo Beach and many other songs, Of course, but this is there. We just heard their song, Do You Ever Wonder? Um, I'm just curious, is this a collaboration, Martha and Mark, together? Uh, yes, it is. We wrote it together. We were, we were t- just discussing that we don't won't really we re- really remember the process of writing this song because it was it was quite a while ago. And uh, I know we wrote it for for our manager p- putting in some a compilation together of his uh, bands that he ha- had on his label, Pop Guru. Uh, yeah, but um, basically we write almost all of our songs together. In the early days, we wrote our songs separately. And then at some point, I think at the um, fourth album, Dance Park, we just decided, you know, let's let's do the Lennon-McCartney thing or, you know, the Keith Richards, uh, Mick Jagger thing and just, you know, whatever proportion of the song we wrote, we'll just go 50-50 on it and it makes it a lot easier. But some are more Mark and some are more more me. And, uh, you know, uh, both write lyrics, we both write music. So it's kind of a bit of a mashup. Absolutely. And what is, I'm going to ask individually, I'll start with you, Martha, what your writing process is. Do you um, pick up your guitar and maybe uh, come up with a riff and put words to it? Or do you write a poem or do you write the words out and then maybe Mark helps you put music to it or you do it yourself on the acoustic? Just I'm curious about your writing process. Well, it changes uh, from time to time. Uh, lately, I've been y- using... Um... Garage band, and uh, I what I do is I manipulate the sounds and and the patterns of rhythm and stuff like that. It's it's so nice to, it's nice to write, be be able to write songs these days with a, a drum drummer, you know, even if it is just a a demo kind of version because I never had drum drums available to me. So I, I experiment a lot, and that's how I write the lyrics. I I sometimes I have the lyrics first, and then I fit them to some music. Or I, I write, start with the music first. A variety of ways. Sometimes I just dream about this song. And I wake up and I, I'll write it down. That's awesome. I know I have dreamt a hit song before and woke up and forgot it. Yeah, I think everybody. I know does. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> know that that has happened. Um, Mark, how about you? Um, uh, your writing process is it similar? Uh, well, just before I get into that, Barry, you know, when you do wake up having written that hit song, you got to be on it really fast, okay? I know. <laughs> By the time you find your, your your phone or your piece of paper and a pen, it's all gone. <laughs> yeah, you got to be really on top of that because it does go away really quickly. But in terms of uh, my writing process, I think Martha's faster writing songs than I am. Like, I, I have... Um, piles of little pieces of paper, which at some point I decided I should keep in a manila envelope so they weren't scattered all over the house. But literally there's decades worth of lyrics all over the place on these little bits of paper. And then every few years, it seems, or maybe more, like maybe longer periods of time go by, I'll get out these pieces of paper and actually write a song um, but in, at least in terms of lyrics and then musically, it can come from anywhere. It can come from, you know, a melody in my head, uh, fooling around on the guitar, uh, you know, just some odd sound. It, you, you have to, um, I think both of us always have our ears and eyes open to everything because we get song ideas from you know everywhere and i think um anyone who's starting out writing songs should try and be interested in everything and keep and you know that you can get lyric ideas from what you've read uh what you hear you know you should always your antennae should always be buzzing and there to pick stuff up Agree. Absolutely. Um, and that's just amazing that you have little bits of, of, of lyrics on pieces of paper all over the place. Um, it's uh, and, and to go back and, and do an album by, by 
by picking out stuff that you've already done and, and put it on an album because I'm sure you guys here you have a lot more stuff um, as well. Yeah, we have tons of stuff, don't we, Martha? Yeah, still more. A lot, a lot of it. We will have the light of day, and some of it. I guess, I guess, maybe we'll do a second album in a few years. No, there's a yeah, lot. Absolutely. of absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot. Of Sorry, stuff. go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say there's a lot of stuff kicking around that, um, you know, and and part of the process is sometimes it just sits around for well, sometimes decades, sometimes years, sometimes five minutes. And then, you know, maybe a year later you go, oh, that was garbage and it gets thrown out. Or you go, wow, that was really good. Let's do something with it. We have a song that um, we wrote together about the Hurricane Katrina. And then that was like, what, 10 years ago? <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe longer. But it's, it's a great riff on, a, on the acoustic guitar and a, a melody and lyric that I, I wrote. But, you know, who That's knows amazing. if it'll ever be heard. <laughs> The, the weird thing is it's so hard to determine what's a good song and what's not. How many songs are not good that are super hits um, out there from all different kinds of bands? And that's something that's always mm, kind of intrigued me. Uh, I just, when, when I record, I usually just write a song um, and then go in and record it. I don't really, well, it's not like I have hundreds anyway, but um, I, I kind of don't write a bunch and pick and choose. I usually write a song and then say, Doug, I'm coming into the studio to record it. So it's so hard to tell, you know, what's good and what's bad. And also it's, it's amazing how many B sides of a single or 45 that has been released. That was the big hit and not the A side. It's so hard to determine, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And you know, it sounds like your songwriting process is sort of more like what Prince would do, you know, what he used to do. Like he'd write a song, uh, you know, and then go in that night and record the whole thing and then mix it and it was done. Yeah, get it all done in like 48 hours but not sleep for the 48 yeah. hours. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's six hours usually write the song and then call Doug and go in the studio and, and record it in six hours or eight hours or something in his studio. That's usually what I do. And uh, and they're not always, you know, for me, I listen to them back and go, geez, that wasn't such a great song after all. But, you know, they don't want, I don't want to let anything go by. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's hard to get a perspective sometimes. I also write lyrics. Um, uh, I, I try to write lyrics, like finish them when I, I get an idea. I'll start with a, a title often, and then I, I get through the whole song. Because I find if you leave a, half, a song half written uh, lyrically, it's really hard to come back to it later on because you sort of forgot the essence of the song, the emotion. Yeah, you, yeah, you're in that you're in that emotion at the time, and then it's hard to get back into it after. Totally understand. Um, why don't we go ahead? I want to play another song here um, off the album, which is uh, my definitely one of my favorites. Um, before we do that, let me ask you guys what it was like receiving a Juno Award. How you guys found out when you got the call or the email? uh back in the day and you got and, and you got the call hey you guys are up for a juno award um for echo beach what man what was that like well um uh, first of all i think we thought we wouldn't win it um it's always great being recognized you know by your mm -hmm. by your country so you know it, it's obviously an honor to to get an award like that um, and then when we went that evening, um, we were in the audience and, uh, they announced, and they said, well, I guess it was single of the year, right? Yeah. And, um, song of, year, song, of song of the year, single. And they went, and the winner is Anne Murray. And we went, okay. So, you know, we didn't get it. <laughs> and then they went, hold on. There's, there's another name here. It's a tie. It's a tie. And they kidding. went, oh, and it's Echo Beach with Martha and the Muffins. So, <laughs> We were going, wow, that's weird. And I think it's one of the few times. I think it's I'm, the I'm only a, time. Yeah, I don't know enough about the history of the Junos. Like, it might be the only time that there was a tie. There was a tie. And, you know, oh, wow. as much as I have a lot of respect for Anne Murray going, well, she's already won like a hundred of these things. How come we just can't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> by ourselves? She probably thought the same thing. <laughs> Not that we'd won a hundred whole lot before no but then, you know but uh yeah so that you know it was a cool thing but it was an odd moment you know because we went oh you know in that first second we're going okay Anne murray you know won yet another one 
Uh, and then all of a sudden we found we were tied with her. So, you know. And she wasn't there, I don't think. No, I don't think she was there that evening. We didn't have to share the stage with her. <laughs> <laughs> right, there you go. Well, that's uh, that's just amazing. Good for you guys. And did you guys uh, know that Echo Beach, when you guys recorded this song or, uh, or were writing it, did you have any inclination at all that this was going to be a hit song? Well, we always got a good reaction to the song when we played it live, right from the beginning, cool. from the, the playing it at the Beverly Tavern, right to, you know, it'd be, it'd be coming out as a single. So um, it was really exciting when it was came out in England um, first, and um, we get calls from the record company uh, saying, "Oh, it's at number forty-two. Oh, it's now at number twenty-one. You know, now it's in, now it's in the top ten. Wow. It was really exciting for this to for have to have that kind of uh, success. But as Martha says, like even from the earliest days, like I, we actually have a recording of one of the early shows we did at the Beverly Tavern, and you know, so we're talking about an audience of what, like thirty, 30 people, people. Yeah. <laughs> and. Right. Um, I'd broken a guitar string. So, you know, the, the tape recorder is running and, and people are screaming and yelling. Um, and I'm trying to tune my guitar and I'm going, ding, 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 ding. And, <laughs> and Martha goes, or somebody goes, and, you know, I don't know whether you announced Echo Beach or I just started playing the riff, which is unbelievably out of tune. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I, I was rushed. So the guitar is really out of tune. And there we go, sailing merrily into into the song, you know, with this completely out of tune guitar. But it was one of those, you know, moments of uh, of weirdness at the Be at the Beverly Tavern. The audience was really into it. Yeah, yeah, they're all screaming, you know. So it didn't really matter whether we were out of tune or not. So it sounds like sounds like some of the earlier Beatles shows. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the Cavern. Yeah. Yeah, well, girls screaming. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I want to go ahead and play your next song. Like I said, this is one of my favorite off, off the album. Um, <clears throat> and I want uh, to come back and ask you uh, how you incorporated or uh, incorporated with the, uh, to call it the Echo Beach version. I mean, obviously the the rhythms in there, the riff, um, but it's just a, it's a fabulous song. So let's play that. We'll come back and talk about it, folks. I have Martha Johnson and Mark Gain from Martha and the Muffins on the show this evening. We're going to hear one of their new songs called On a Silent Summer Evening. And this is also in brackets, uh, the Echo Beach version. So right here on this House of Musicians radio show on Reality Radio 101. Time away. 
Welcome back. I have Martha Johnson and Mark Gain from Martha and the Muffins, uh, Martha and the Muffins on the show this evening. And we just heard their new song on a silent summer evening, uh, the Echo Beach version. Guys, what a great riff that that is. And um, um, I just I love the groove of that song. Uh, um, Mark, tell me about your guitar playing and what you were using uh, on that song. Uh, well, basically, that version on a silent summer evening is made from samples and uh, bits and pieces of the original song. Um, but basically, uh, the riff is played on a Les Paul custom. I'm left-handed, so the guitar is left-handed. Um, wow. It was, I think, on the original song, it was played through a jazz chorus amp, if anybody knows what that is. They're very... They were very popular back in the day. Um, they're a very clean but very loud amp. I don't think mine, even on stage, ever went past about 10 because it, it's 150 watts or 120 watts rather. But anyway, we're, we're getting too technical here. But And then, of <laughs> course, pedal. So that, that was basically the, the, uh, the sound. Um, but, you know, obviously on that cup, we're doing a lot of uh sampling and cutting and pasting as well yeah absolutely and i uh, just i just love the groove of it um i want i'm going to ask you um i like to ask my favorite part of the show all the artists um what 
some, just tell me something crazy that's happened to you guys either on stage or touring in a different country or on a tour bus or a plane or whichever, but just a crazy story that's, that's happened to you. Something that stands out. Well, I remember well, we were playing in, I think it was in Syracuse. And uh, well, often you get the worst uh, dressing rooms. I think any band would, would agree that the dressing rooms are usually pretty terrible. In, in, in any venue. This one was particularly bad because it was a, a restaurant as well. And uh, I remember after they called us to the stage. And one, one thing was that we couldn't find the stage. It was just like Spinal Tap. And we, we were lost in the basement of the, of the, of the, the building. And we couldn't find the stage and they were going, hey, there's Martha in the Muffins. And they were, <laughs> and they were all <laughs> screaming, Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> And we and the other thing was that because it was a restaurant, there was grease on everything, and you were sliding around like a skating rink on on, on the floor. Yeah, I remember wow. that. Like we had to go through the kitchen, and everything, every surface of the kitchen was covered in grease. You couldn't grab a pipe or a yeah table or anything. It was just awful. I thought I was going to fall and break my guitar. That was my big worry because I was sliding around the floor, and we're trying to find the stairs up to the the stage and you know all these people are scram uh, screaming and pounding tables and yeah. stuff and uh as Martha says it was like spinal tap um it was a real <laughs> spinal tap moment the other one that comes yeah, to mind nope. is a uh, swiss night in ottawa it was, a, it was a government run show and uh we were getting very well paid we had a great band we had david pilch and mike slosky and holly cole was doing backup vocals and uh it was a really good band um and uh, it w turned out that the audience was mostly seniors and it was called Swiss Night. And they, they, a lot of them were wearing Lederhausen and they, they weren't expecting <laughs> us and we weren't expecting them. No, <laughs> that's dance, hilarious. But they got up and danced to, um, to uh, Echo Beach. <laughs> but in that in well, a, in a particularly Swiss style. Yeah. That's hilarious. That's just that's that's incredible. Mark, is there anything that stands out with you besides the greasy uh, ki the greasy kitchen floor? Uh, well, that was a good one. Yeah, <laughs> but um, well, there was a moment when we were opening for Eurythmics in uh, Forest Hills, New York, and uh, we were no longer with Virgin Records because we'd uh, ended our relationship with Math of the Third Album, and our manager at the time. We were in the trailer waiting to go on and our manager came in and he said, uh, Mark, Martha, you've got a visitor. And uh, we opened the door and it was Richard Branson who we had had many encounters with when he was running Virgin Records, but he also engineered a recording deal where we never saw any money. So Richard sort of walked up and put his hand up and went, hi, Mark, hi, Martha, how are you? And I refused to shake his hand because the guy was ripping us off. And wow. uh, so, so for a moment, he looked sort of confused and uh, dropped his hand because <laughs> I wasn't going to shake it. Yeah, that's that's just incredible. That's uh, that's crazy. I mean, we won't get into those details, but wow, for a guy that you know has that kind of money. But um, um, nor here nor there. Um, uh, upcoming shows. You guys have any upcoming shows? I mean, I know the COVID thing has happened and, and we're still kind of in it a bit. Um, I know some bands are out playing here and there. How about you guys? Uh, well, I have a health issue now. Um, I have Parkinson's disease and uh, I've had it for 20, 21 years now. And it's uh, kind of caught up with us and it doesn't allow me to do any live sh shows anymore. I haven't got the, uh, the strength in my voice. So, uh, well, isn't it just... It's dry, but... Uh, you know, life goes on. It's awesome that you can still um, record music and put it out there for everybody. I mean, you haven't gone away, so that's just that's just amazing. Good for you. It's great. It's all all in your attitude to to how you, you deal yeah. with things like that. Absolutely, and uh, and it's been it's been an honor to have you guys on the show. But before we go, there's a segment of the show I like to do called Well, Gary Labar. What do you think, sir? What do I think? Oh, my goodness. Martha, you have not lost it. Your voice is still beautiful. 
you know, I'm in my 60s and I knew about you guys, you know, back in the day with the hit song Echo Beach. In in New uh, York. Yeah, from New York. And uh, wow, you know, you just have the production, by the way, of the songs is remarkable. You know, I'm listening to it pretty high end here in the studio, and it's. I think what you guys did, you know, with your editing and everything, is phenomenal. And and Martha, thank you very much for telling us about Parkinson's. I know you guys are involved with the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and um, it's very very important to get the word out about um, this particular disease. And you're a hero for that because, man, for you still to get in there and record and do what you guys are doing. It's amazing. I wish you the best, and you're in my prayers. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And 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 it's it's an absolute honor to have you um, both on the show. Um, I look forward to listening to more new music. Hopefully, you will come out with a second album of of songs that you have. And it's an absolute honor to talk to both of you. Thank you both for um, helping build the house that we all grew up in. And we appreciate it. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, uh, Gary and Barry. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. You're up. Ab- you're absolutely welcome. And to the listener, I say thank you for being here. Always dance and sing and let the music bring your soul to the surface for all the world to see. Until next time, have a shuffle your feet kind of week and good night. You've been listening to This House of Musicians on Reality Radio 101.